Hello, and welcome to the Catholic Art Guild podcast. I'm your host, Kathleen Carr. I'm the president and founder of the Catholic Art Institute. And I'd like to welcome our guest today, Dr. Dennis McNamara. Dr. Dennis McNamara is the director for the Center of Beauty and Culture at Benedictine College, as well as an associate professor there. He also served as associate director and professor at Mundelein Seminary. He holds a BA in the history of art from Yale University and a PhD in architectural history from the University of Virginia, where he concentrated his research on the study of ecclesiastical architecture in the 19th and 20th centuries. Dennis is also co-host of the award-winning podcast on the sacred liturgy called The Liturgy Guys. He is the author of a number of articles and three books, um, Heavenly City, the architecture architectural tradition of Catholic Chicago, Catholic Catholic Church Architecture and the Spirit of the Liturgy, and the third book, I'm sorry I didn't have. It's called How to Read Churches, A Crash Course in Ecclesiastical Architecture. Okay, of course. All right. Sorry, I didn't have that notated. Um, He has also served on the Art and Architecture Commission of the Archdiocese of Chicago and works frequently with architects and pastors in church renovations and new design. I'd also like to thank Dennis for joining the advisory board of the Catholic Art Institute, as well as agreeing to be the juror for the Catholic Art Institute Sacred Art Prize 2020. Uh, Please welcome to the program, Dennis. (laughs) Yeah, hi Kathleen, good to be with you. Hi, thanks for joining me. I was hoping to discuss several things, uh, including the culture and state of the Catholic arts and how we can work towards the renewal of both since both of our efforts have a similar mission, yours in a university setting, and uh, the Catholic Art Institute is more of a social educational organization for the laity and artists, clergy, etc. So um, I was hoping we could begin a bit, um, if you could just talk about your background and your study of church architecture and how you got into your career. Yeah, sure. I mean, I studied mainstream art historical and architectural historical method and secular universities for the most part and didn't really have any connection with theology and architecture it was who built it what was the year what's the social conditions and um the idea of architecture and art as being part of the sacramental system or the sacramental worldview that is the things of the heavenly become knowable on earth through matter through painting sculpture metalwork, buildings, the design of cities was not really part of my education, except for one particular scholar named Bill Westfall, who is now retired, but was eventually the dean at the Notre Dame School of Architecture. And he taught us about architecture as the built form of ideas. In other words, there's an invisible concept in the mind, kind of like the Greek polis, you know, is the idea of the, the way people live together. But then you actually build the city and they have a relationship with each other. And there was this little crack in the door for me, and how architecture was more than just a series of historical occurrences that are kind of arbitrary, but were actually part of a plan of how people view the world, how they understand their relationship to the creator, how they understand their relationship to fallen humanity and perfection and, and the anticipation of the things of heaven. And then fortunately, I was able to teach theology for a long time and um, learned crash course kind of in theology, sacred theology and sacramental theology and saw all of a sudden how the idea of art and architecture as material revealers of the things of heaven in the mind of God uh, is actually the real mission of, of the artist, of every artist, and particularly art for the church. And that just opened this big blossoming uh, flower of intellectual ideas about what art is and, and what it's for. And fortunately, now I'm at Benedictine College, which is a place that brought me here to teach that. And the students are uh, really, really enjoying it. And I'm very happy to be here, too. Yeah, well, maybe you could expand a bit upon uh, your new role and the Center for uh, Beauty and Culture. It's um, It sounds really interesting. I'd love to hear more about it. Yeah, well, you know, the uh, college here, Benedictine College, is in northeast Kansas. It's a small town. And not too many people have heard of it, but it's got this very strong Catholic identity. And they had a 20-year plan about 20 years ago, which was to build new buildings, strengthen the program, increase enrollment. And it was so successful, they've actually quadrupled their student enrollment. And there's just a sense of um, forward momentum here and this very strong Catholic identity. So when they came to the end of their um, 20-year plan, they said, okay, we have to have a new 20-year plan. And they realized they don't want to get too much bigger than they are now in terms of student enrollment. What they wanted to do was take the great things that are happening here and turn it outward and sort of shine that light out into the world. So it was called Transforming Culture in America. And so the idea was to have these different centers that would take the 
kind of brain trust of Benedictine and help it not only teach the students here so they can transform culture in America, but to be a source of education, things like podcasts, lectures, uh, giving talks, um, whatever, whatever it is, doing things like this. And that's a big task, uh, transform culture in America. But that's that's how things are around here. The president's kind of fearless. And the idea is if we if we proclaim the truth, if we speak it with joy and well-founded theology and articulate expression, that hopefully will bring people to accept and understand what this what beauty is, this revelation of the truth of things, and then people will be drawn to it. And that's the goal. So how that will actually happen, God only knows, but every day I try to figure out new ways to do that. Yeah, well, I see that one of them is um, some of your interesting course offerings, um, because it's obvious that the college understands that there is a, a major need for beauty in the culture and a focus on it. So you have a, a course called uh, Theology of Beauty. Um, what would you say the role of beauty is? Why is it important, um, especially in the liturgy, etc.? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I call that, that course Sacramental Aesthetics. And sacramental means making the invisible visible in matter, right? So there's the invisible things that God knows. And the presence of God, for instance, is made visible and knowable through the Eucharist. So it takes matter and lets God's presence radiate uh, through it. So how does the invisible become visible? And then aesthetics is how does beauty do that? And so in this understanding of beauty, we're talking about maximizing the permeability between heaven and earth. So God has perfect intellect and his realm of heaven is perfectly ordered. We don't have perfect intellect and our realm is not perfectly ordered. So our job is always to bring it to that level of understanding and also that level of order. And when that happens, when that revelation of the mind of God comes through something, uh, we call that beautiful. Now, this is very different from the modern world, which tends to think beauty is something that the dilettante smart people like, things that uh, enough scholars agree upon, something that makes me feel good, the red carpet, you know, the cover of People magazine, that kind of thing. What we're talking about here is something quite different. And that is everything on earth has a nature. So whether it's a car or a tree or a person, and when that thing reveals its nature, what we call the ontological reality, that's the nature of its being, that's what we call beautiful. In other words, it becomes transparent to the mind of God as, as the full understanding of the nature of the thing. And then when we have something presented to us so clearly and so perfectly and so articulately, we naturally desire it because we see what's true. Because we have a hunger for the truth just like if once you have a hunger for food and you know, even the secular people of the world want to know why did it where did i come from why am i here you know what's on the edge of the universe is there a god or not what's the point of life this is all a hunger for truth and when something reveals the truth very precisely and fully and easily we call that beauty or beautiful and so that's um that's a different way of thinking about beauty than most people uh, do yes that's and it's an important, profound way of thinking of beauty. So I was wondering if we could expound on the topic of beauty and art. Um, and I'd like to focus on the role of artists, uh, or as JP, you know, John Paul II called mm -hmm. artists, the custodians of beauty. Um, right. Perhaps we could define art um, and, and then maybe discuss what the faith or God would be calling artists to do or reveal. Sure. Call John Paul II's letter to artists, he was trying to bridge the gap between the church and the arts. And many popes have tried to do that. Paul VI tried to do that. John XXIII tried to do that. To some degree, Pius XII, even before Vatican II, tried to do that. And I think what they realized was that the secular art world have, was going off in one direction. Art is the expression of my emotions. Art is the political critique of the day. Art is some kind of crafted version that causes an emotional response of shock or horror or ugliness in somebody, or it's just whatever I feel that day. I just lob something onto the canvas and say, well, those are my emotions and you can't argue with my emotions. Well, to some degree, I mean, those things participate in the craft of art. But what John Paul wanted artists to realize is that they actually have a vocation. And that means a call from God that they have, just like a sports player might have a kind of built-in ability to you know, hit a free throw or something. He would say artists were sort of given at birth this call to be revealers of divine beauty. And of course, they have to learn their own craft. And so there's always this combination between God's gift and human effort. But the idea is just like an opera singer is kind of born with the right vocal cords. An artist is born with the capacity to see beyond, to see beyond the complacent world. And that's why artists are unhappy a lot, he says, because they always see the perfection. They have the vis vision of perfection and the world is never perfect. And most people don't understand 
why they're unhappy all the time. Right. So he's trying to help artists understand, hey, your goal in life, given by God, this capacity to see beyond the fallen world into the perfection of heavenly beauty, and then sort of draw that heavenly beauty back to earth. If an artist understands his or her vocation that way, that sets it on a whole different track than whatever sells in the galleries or whatever the secular world gives you a lot of earthly praise for. Yes, and that is a powerful vocation that and call for artists, which um, ultimately, when fostered correctly, it would transform the culture. So what do you think are some of the causes of the decline in culture and what the liturgy could play in helping restore a culture of beauty, truth, and goodness? Well, sure. You know, the culture, as it moves away from a sacramental worldview, and I think a lot of this you can stem it all the way back to the, maybe not the Renaissance so much, but a lot of the um, polemics around the um, Protestant Reformation and then, of course, the French Revolution. If there is no pre-existing reality in the spiritual realm, then there's no truth to reveal. It's just whatever I decide is real. So you think about the style revivals in the 19th century, Greek revival, Roman revival. They weren't saying, oh, how do I best embody the perfection of heaven? They were saying, oh, Greek, they did something good. Let's copy them. And so you see, instead of embodying an invisible full reality, they were copying an earthly reality. And then slowly that degenerates. Well, Greek was then and we're not Greek. So maybe we'll find another style and another style. Then they realize the styles themselves don't mean that much. And then they say, style is ridiculous. So that one theory after another comes why architecture should be what it is. Same thing with art. First, it was always revelation of heavenly realities. Then it became history painted. You know, you see generals dying on the battlefield or portraits of George Washington. And then it became not history, but regular old people, water lilies, ballet dancers, French cafes. As lovely as those paintings are, you can see how they're diminishing the content of those paintings. And then it became three blobs on a, on a canvas. And then it becomes a urinal that you can buy in a, you know, bathroom supply studio catalog. And you see how art starts to decline because it's moving away from, there's a fullness of reality we're trying to reveal and encounter in whatever medium we choose. And it becomes this sort of more and more eccentric personal self-expression. But you see, there's always a, there's always a philosophy in here in some degree theology. Right. Either there's a God and I reveal the fullness of that truth or there's no God and I reveal the fullness of history or there's no God and I reveal the fullness of, you know, cafe scenes in the streets of Paris. And it starts to become less and less a sacramental revelation. Now, what liturgy demands and what the Catholic understanding always demands is we are revealing a pre-existing reality. All the arts come together in liturgy. You have music, you have poetic language, you have embroidery, you have goldsmithing, you have gems, you have stained glass, you have stonework, woodwork, uh, everything you can imagine all comes together. Bookbinding, uh, even organ playing, orchestral playing, the voice, and it demands by definition, liturgy demands to reveal a pre-existing reality called what does the worship of heaven look like? What does the realities of the heavenly Jerusalem look like? What would the garment of salvation look like? If you go to heaven and your clothes are glorified and brought to the heavenly perfection, what would they look like? And so a chasuble isn't just a regular old street clothes for a priest. It's something that indicates that he's putting on heavenly realities. And so when liturgy is modeled properly at every level, the heart, the head, and all of the arts come together and are in service of God, and then becomes transparent to the heavenly uh, fulfillment of what God wants for us, our own heavenly future. And so if we can model liturgy right, then hopefully that will spill out into all the other things that serve liturgy, and then all the other uh, arts that would grow from there. Yeah, and the beauty of all of those uh, parts coming together in the liturgy will help to move people in a way where perhaps simply just preaching or some other thing um, couldn't reach them or doesn't reach them. There's a, there's a special um, power that beauty has to draw people out of themselves and, and to want to pursue something that is true. Um, and, exactly. And there's a saying that I came up with and I sort of teach it to students that is beauty is to truth as delicious is to food, right? You can give people nourishing, flavorless gruel. But chances are they're not going to enjoy it that much. They'll eat it rather than die. But if the food is delicious, then people actually desire it. And there's no such thing called a bottle of delicious at the supermarket. You know, just add delicious. It's because the right ingredients are in the right proportion 
there's some not too much, not too little, and everything is just right. So that you know, whether it's oatmeal or lasagna or or whatever whatever you like to eat, the reality of that thing is being made known to the taste buds. And so you don't have to say eat this or else, because people naturally desire it. If you present the truth in the same way, that it's uh, full understanding, the mind which desires to know comes to know. Uh, there's a naturally attractive power to that. And so you don't have to force it down people's throats. This is why Pope Benedict talked about our age wanting to use the via pulchritudinis or the way of beauty, right. because our time doesn't like being told what to do, you know, believe this or else, behave this way or else. And so the truth and the goodness model, although they're, they're right, are not necessarily attractive to the secularized world. But what he did realize is that people still go to art museums. They still like craft beer. They still like organic produce, right? So there's something about letting an apple be an apple, organic, not covered in pesticides that lets the appleness come forward and then people are naturally attracted to it. You take the truth and you say, God is love itself. God is goodness itself. God wants your flourishing. God wants you to be welcomed into the embrace of the creator who made you so you can be loved and brought to the highest level of perfection. That's a whole lot better than do this or go to hell. Even though the do this or go to hell model is true, it's not very attractive. It's eat this or die. Well, okay. Eat this cookie because it's delicious is a lot easier than eat this or die. And so presenting the truth in a beautiful way uh, will make it attractive. And that's one of the classic understandings of beauty is that it stirs desire for that which is known. Uh, it stirs desire for the good. It moves your will toward the good. You can you can think about people who go to Rome. They go to see the Sistine Chapel or whatever. It's, it's really complicated and expensive and you have to wait on lines and you have to deal with you know, Roman cab drivers and expensive airline tickets. And why do they do it? Because there's something about that beauty that is attracting them toward, which is good. And that notion of being, um, moving your will toward the good is what Augustine, St. Augustine called love. Wow. So beauty produces desire for the good, which is what we call love. And so if you want people to love the faith, you want them to love whatever it is you're trying to get them to love, uh, beauty is really helpful in getting that done. Okay. And that it's true, because I think when you take the liturgy seriously, and, you know, as you've discussed previously, the church building is a vision of heaven. And as you talked about the garments, you know, the chalcibles and all of these things, when you understand the symbolism that's needed there and why they're there, they're not simply just uh, ornamentation. That they really are communicating that something's, you know, that the holy sacrifice of the mass and our our God is being made present. And, and I think that's why there's a need for that beauty in the liturgy and and it's you know the place for those of us with artistic gifts you know it's it's our role you know with the, the corinthians reading about the hand and doesn't tell the head i've always mm -hmm. read that a certain way and thought you know well sometimes the head seems to want to tell the hand or the artist that you know we, we don't matter as much or it's just about the preaching sometimes so you know the the balance that you're discussing is um I, I think is exactly right. If you put your finger on that and, and it's inspiring. And where, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's where ontology comes in. You know, when, whenever you teach, your students always make fun of you, things you say all the time. And I get teased for, for speaking about ontology. Ontos in Greek means being. And Jacques Maritain and others interpret Thomas Aquinas and others in the classical realist tradition of beauty that we call a thing beautiful when it reveals its ontological reality. That is what it is. And when it does that, it by definition becomes a bearer of its own presence to you. And so, you know, you have the ontological reality of a human being, <laughs> a woman and not a car or a, or a peach. And so you're a beautiful person because your ontological reality is coming through. And when we let the liturgy be the liturgy, when we let the arts that serve it be what they're supposed to be, not covered up in unnecessary complications, not diminished beneath the revelation of themselves. So not just fancy for the sake of fancy, not abstract for the sake of abstract, but have everything a thing needs to be revealing what it is to you, then you can just say, I know, the, oh, I know this. If you see a church that doesn't look like a church, you say, that's a church. Well, the sign says church, but it doesn't look like a church. And it looks like a pizza hut or it looks like an airplane hangar or whatever people say the churches look like that don't look like churches. You see what you have to do then? You have to do all this work. The sign says church, but it doesn't look like a church. And then if the church is revealing itself, churchness, you just go, ah, now that's a church, right? I now am encountering churchness. Think of it like a chocolate chip cookie. If it came out like a snickerdoodle or something, you'd say, hey, this is not revealing chocolate chip cookiness to me. And you start to get mentally you know, confused and have to do the work of discovery. 
Where what Aquinas and others say is if a thing is beautiful, it just reveals itself to you so beautifully and so perfectly, perfectly and easily that you don't even have to ask what it is. You just get to encounter the thing itself and it has its own compelling power. And so this is what happens when you meet a loving person. You don't say, oh, this person is moving this way and looking at me with their eyebrows. That way you just say, I'm being loved. Or this thing is so beautiful that I'm just going to be in its presence and then it has a transformative effect. And so self-revelation is at the heart of what uh, beauty is. And because God has perfect self-revelation, he's perfect. That's why he's beauty itself and everything else participates in that uh, self-revelation. Amazing. Well said. Thanks. <laughs> it's complicated and it's also very easy at the same time. If you want to be known, you have to let yourself be known. If one artist wants a, whatever they're making to be known, it has to be the thing they're trying to get across and to be known by others. Which I, I, I think is a good segue into, you know, what it, the importance of artists and understanding their faith. Um, and I see that, um, that you've got courses that you're offering. Um, so not only at the center, and this is the more university setting, but uh, these are very fascinating, these courses that are offered online uh, very reasonable prices, which I think w would carry on this conversation and be very helpful to artists. You know, this liturgical art and architecture. Um, maybe you could just share a bit about this and, and some of the things that you think would be important um, for sacred artists to know and understand about their faith as they, you know, w continue to work and grow or make sacred art commissions, whatever. Right. If I, I think the classes you're talking about are the online certificate courses at the Liturgical Institute at Mundelein. So yeah. That's just liturgicalinstitute.org. And those are non-credit courses that, you know, you can take a little exam at the end if you want a certificate, but it's not really meant to be that way. So there are five sessions in each course. They're one hour each, and they're an introduction to different things. One's on the theology of liturgical music, the documents of music. One's on aesthetics itself, that sacramental aesthetics course I just mentioned. Um, another one's liturgical art and architecture, and it always comes back to the same thing. What is a thing at the, at the very nature, the depth of its indivisible reality? So I know this kind of essence and, and es ends and essay, all this Thomistic language can be kind of complicated, but it's actually very simple. Say you, Kathleen, as an artist, have an image in your mind of a painting you want to paint. It's in your mind, and it's unknowable, except to you, right? Unless I can read your mind, which I can it's your, you know, psychic powers or something. Right. <laughs> so you have to take that invisible thing and make it visible in a statue, a painting, a building, a composition of music, whatever it happens to be in that case. And so the idea you have in your mind is the starting point. But that idea might be right. It might be wrong. It might be well-formed. It might be not well-formed. It might be informed by a divine revelation of the Holy Spirit and therefore will reveal something more and better than somebody else did two years ago or 10 years ago, or even 100 years ago. We're not talking about style and history so much as maximum revelation of the knowledge and reality of a thing, which is kind of complicated again, but so also really simple. There, when iconographers in the Eastern tradition of the church have to make an icon, they'll pray and fast so they can quiet their own human passions. They can let the Holy Spirit work in them. And they'll say that the, the icon is actually painted together with their hand and the Holy Spirit, which is why they don't sign their names on icons. Sometimes they'll say by the hand of so-and-so. In other words, the Holy Spirit guided my hand <laughs> to make this icon. And so that's the kind of sacramental approach to art. And of course, like liturgical art and architecture to say, oh yeah, well, what is the liturgy of heaven like? And the book, book of Revelation tells us there's this throne in heaven and Christ is seated on it. There's an emerald rainbow around it. There's angels and saints singing his praises. There's this new garden, like the Garden of Eden, but now glorified and trees and water and four rivers and everything. Like, okay, well, there's your heavenly vision. How can my church look like that? So first you have to know, then you have to process, then you have to draw, then someone has to build. It's a really important um, collaboration between artists, architects, patrons. Of course, someone has to pay for it and someone has to make it earthquake proof and acoustically <laughs> appropriate. So that, like, if you think about building a church, how complicated that is. So knowing what the thing is, is the first step. I mean, in my experience over the years, this knowledge of, the nature of church buildings is growing, but for the most part, you had pastors who just found an architect around the corner, or was the brother-in-law of somebody who worked at the parish, maybe never designed a church before, didn't know what the heavenly Jerusalem was, couldn't define a sacrament to save their lives. 
And they saw the church building as a kind of auditorium with a cross on the roof, as opposed to the sacrament of this much larger vision. And I think, of course, like liturgical art and architecture stays around that idea so that when people do decide to be on a committee or hire an architect or be an architect, they know what they're supposed to be doing. I love to compare it to a brain, you know, and a brain surgeon. Brain surgeon has to know the ideal of a healthy brain. If they're going to put some nerves in the wrong place, they're not putting the brain back together after the surgery. And you wouldn't want your architect to not know what a church is, just like you wouldn't want your brain surgeon not to know what a brain is. And somehow we'll go across the country of the world to find the best brain surgeon who's an expert in the field. In church architecture, we hire the architect around the corner whose specialty is you know, sewage treatment plants and toll booths and things like that and say, make a church. And then we wonder why it doesn't come out. Uh, very well. Yeah. And that course, I know, would probably do well to speak to a lot of the symbolism, the nave, the sanctuary, you know, the separation and all of the, the biblical uh, passages that go with that. And I guess there's some of the things that you've done online. But I, I think for, you know, those that would be interested in s researching this further, that sounds like a really ideal course for that. It's also really scriptural, if you don't mind me, you know, going on again. No. Uh, when I started researching for the second book that I did called Catholic Church Architecture and the Spirit of the Liturgy, I wasn't really expecting there to be a lot of biblical uh, theological foundation for Catholic churches. I, I was under the assumption, a lot of people are, that church architecture was kind of invented in the fourth century and that the early Christians sort of worshipped in their homes. And there was a lot of polemic around that in the 90s, 80s and 90s, that churches were just big houses. And that's why they look like beige drywall and wooden floors and, you know, movable chairs and houseplants. Right. But I actually started to read. It's like, oh, yeah, Adam and Eve are in the garden with God and everything's right. They're with the angels. They're walking around in this garden. Everything's right. And then when they blow that at the fall, God tries to bring Israel back into some version of this garden. And right away, early on in Scripture, Moses gets this vision of heaven and he's told to make the tabernacle of Moses, which is this kind of portable tent, but it's all woven with fabrics of, of uh, leaves and flowers and plants and trees. And then the Ark of the Covenant is in the, the back room of it, the Holy of Holies, so to speak. And God sits on that and it's God's presence in the garden with the world, but it's been shrunk to this little building. And then they build the Temple of Solomon. And it's the same thing. Leaves, buds, flowers, angels, saints, carved panels of cedar covered in gold, and then the veil that represented all that separated heaven and earth. And here was, again, was this microcosm of this new world that God wanted people to, to live in. And it was still restricted to a little building. And then Christ is the one who takes all of creation on himself, brings it back to the Father. And then this growth and glory can go out and out and out again. So our church buildings actually have a lot of biblical precursors. They're images of the mystical body of Christ, who took all creation on himself, who assembled all the living stones in perfect relationship, and then brought them to glory, which is why you can see things like silk are not just fussy and expensive. They're actually like clothing that's been glorified. You can see gems or a stained glass that looks like gems are not just pieces of glass. They look like stones that have been brought to glory, which is what gems are, right? They're glorified stones. And so everything in the church then has this foundation of anticipating the glory of heaven and in a sense, returning us to the Garden of Eden, but then bringing us to this higher glorified relationship with God. And that's what the building shows. That's why liturgical speech is like that, too. It's not everyday speech. Liturgical music is not everyday music. Uh, even the proclamation of Scripture isn't just, you know, an audio book. It's the letting the Holy Spirit reveal God's word to the world. And everything's brought to this high level of heavenly perfection. Boy, if you get that, then everything else follows uh, suit. You can have any style you want. You can have humble, you can have brand, you can have everything, and it's still the same theological reality. Yeah, fascinating. And I'm so glad that we can share this information with all, all of our listeners, because sometimes it's not always clear, um, because there has been a change and departure in some of the more modern uh, architecture that you were talking about, the Pizza Huts and the reasons behind that. And mm -hmm. um, it's nice to know that if you are having a natural reaction to something, whether it be a piece of art or a building that's not revealing its ontological carrot category. I'm still learning. <laughs> yeah, ontological reality. That's it. <laughs> but you know but what's interesting is you go, you go to many new churches and they have pretty good architects and they have big plate glass windows that look out to the countryside or the mountains or something. People say, oh, I like this building. 
And there is something good about a building that's in a pretty nice ski lodge. You know, it just happens to have mass in it. That's not the same thing as making a sacramental image of the heavenly Jerusalem. It can be good and still not a very good church. And so it's very important to realize it's not a black and white either or issue. You can have a lovely building that doesn't do this sacramentalization of what a church is very well, even though it's good as something else. So pizza huts are great pizza huts. They're just not very good churches. And that's an ontological category that is actually made. That's right. Okay. Well, um, maybe we can move on uh, just to the last um, point, which is sort of tied to what we were just discussing. Uh, you know, when it comes to abstract art uh, for the liturgy in particular, and then maybe things like kitsch or paintings that are very photorealistic or other things that were perhaps like, why would those things not be uh, fitting or for the liturgy? Like it sort of talks, to, you know, speaks to what you're just saying. But... Great. So I answer all these questions the same way, which is if an art, if art is supposed to be a sacramental revelation, remember a sacrament is making active and present to somebody that which is otherwise unknowable. So an angel, a saint, the face of Christ, most of us don't have access to those things with our senses normally. A few mystics do, but that's pretty rare. So you have to make something that allows that to be present in the world. And so Christ is called this sacrament of the Father in the sense that he took on matter in his body and said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. That's the foundational model for sacramental revelation in general. The things of heaven are known to our senses through matter. So if an artist says, well, I'm just gonna paint three big swaths of color on a canvas and call that faith, well, all right, but it's it's a very limited participation in the sacramental revelation because Christ is a person, first of all, <laughs> who has a body and that body is glorified and those uh, that body is a real thing. If you just say, well, you know, I'm gonna have three swaths of color because that's, that's the same as the body of Christ, you just haven't done it very well. I, I compare it to science sometimes, you know, people who are scientists have to make solutions of different chemicals and so in one test tube, you have 100% hydrochloric acid. You know, if you mix it with 50% water, you have 50% hydrochloric acid. It's half as much. And that's an important thing. Sacramental revelation, you don't want half as much. You want full sacramental revelation. So if it's too abstract, you don't get enough of the thing that you're meant to encounter. On the other hand, if you take it to the other extreme and, and paint it so realistically that it looks like the model and you see there acne and their hair out of place and they're just looking like regular people then you're not actually showing the sacramental condition you're just painting someone in a halloween costume and that happens to be a saint so i know you and i talked about a talk we did together a long time ago called don't paint the model so as an artist you might want to say oh well i'll put somebody in a saint therese costume and then you paint your next door neighbor in a saint therese costume what you've made is a portrait of your neighbor in funny clothes what the java liturgical artist to do is to find out what does that saint look like in heaven now? How did they become abstracted enough so that it's not just the model in your studio, but specific enough that it's recognizable? So there's a phrase that I use that I can always never remember. Uh, let me see if I can do it, but it's the liturgical art should be naturalistic enough to be legible, right? It has enough detail of the nature of the thing so you know what it is, but it has to be abstracted enough to be universal. If you just paint your next door neighbor as the Virgin Mary, you're not getting Virgin Mary-ness. And so it has to be abstracted. In other words, the universal quality of its nature has to be brought through. And then the last one is uh, divinely idealized enough to be eschatological. And the eschaton is the time after the end of the fall. So it's, it's eternity in heaven where everything's brought to glory. There's no more sin, sorrow, or death. So you have to have enough nature to know what it is enough abstraction so that it's not just one example and then enough divine glory that you know it's heavenly and not earthly and that is sort of that's my recipe for a liturgical image and there's a huge freedom in that um, for artists sure. you see if one of those goes then it starts to look either unknowable or too specific and too uh too earthly kitschy sometimes yeah or i i sometimes feel like it looks like you're looking at bad acting like would I have cast, because you're, it's almost like you've cast somebody in the role the, of the Virgin Mary, but it's, you're just not believing it because it, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's too, it's too specific, yeah. it's too pedestrian. And, and, you know, I just think that there, it's something that I've had to revisit with my own sacred art is you just don't want to be pedestrianizing things that should be heavenly. So that you, 
you put it very well that um, sort of the classical way that you have to create the divine. You said something there. Mm-hmm. I, 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 mm-hmm. Yeah, divinely idealized because this right. person brought the heavenly glory. You know what, when you talked about acting, you know what the, what's the number one compliment you can give to an actor is not, oh, you memorize those lines well. I mean, they, they don't want to just memorize the lines, right? That's the same thing as painting your neighbor in a, in a saint costume. What they want to hear is, I forgot you were there and that character radiated through you, right? So you became invisible to the character. And I remember I said this to an actor recently. I saw um, the Christmas Carol and the guy who played Scrooge, I forgot he was an actor and I saw Scrooge on that stage. He became transparent to that invisible reality. So what an artist does, at the, especially at, at the liturgical things, is to become transparent matter becomes transparent to the invisible by being visible. And that's really interesting. It's not by becoming invisible. It's not by denying matter's capacity to do that. It's by recognizing if the artist does it right, what is unknowable will actually come through the material itself. And this is why Catholics, we're fond of art, right? Creation is good. God restored creation by uh, uniting himself to it in the incarnation. And it, it is, if the artist does his or her job right, it will become like a window to these things that are otherwise unknowable, as people often say about icons. Yeah, that's well put. Well, I think that's a really good place to end. I I think that we've covered an awful lot that's going to be really um, helpful, and I enjoyed this. So thanks for your time today, Dennis. This has been a really interesting conversation. Um, My pleasure. Anytime. As you can tell, I love talking about this. And uh, people can feel free to contact me at the Center for Beauty and Culture at Benedictine College. And um, I'm happy to take questions or whatever anybody, whatever anybody would like. Great. And I would love to have you back so we could talk a little bit more in a, a deeper dive into some of these um, topics, probably, you know, in the coming weeks and months. Um, but in the meantime, I will put some links below for the things that we discussed, uh, the, the class at the Liturgical Institute. Um, the various other talks. So that'll be in the links below. So, okay, signing off. Thank you so much again, Dennis. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.